Okay, the other object we're going to look at this week um, is an early hand axe. And what I will try and remember to do is each time we look at an object, I will create a timeline so you can keep track of where exactly we are in terms of when. So let me write on this. So you can see across the top here, we're going to be looking at an extremely early period um, in Egyptian history, 700,000 years BC to about 5,000 years BC. Um, and this period is described as the Paleolithic to the Neolithic. And I've already described a few times that Paleolithic means the Old Stone Age to the Neolithic, uh, which is when people started to do farming, the New Stone Age. Okay, in terms of the hand axes, um, we are looking at, again, a very long time range between 700,000 BC to about 5,000 BC. And what you'll notice if you've um, taken other history courses, especially in um, ancient history, is that historians and archaeologists tend to divide up the time. So it's not, um, uh, so it's just easier to figure out what's going on. So we've got the lower Paleolithic, which is the earliest. So that goes down to about 250,000 BC. And then we've got the middle Paleolithic um, that goes down to about 50,000 BC. And then we have the upper. Um, and we, we sort of know the time ranges of these because of these hand axes. So what I will be talking about is the fact that these hand axes start off very large and then they get progressively smaller, smaller over time. So we sort of use these hand axes to help us date um, date things in ancient Egypt. Um, and of course, before we start looking at these um, interesting hand axes, I want to um, show you a little bit of the geography of ancient Egypt. And so what you're looking at here, um, especially on, on this side, is really more than what Egypt is. So the, I don't want to say boundary of ancient Egypt was about this red line. Not always, because because in some of the uh, dynasties, they pushed pretty far south into the kingdom of Kush and, and Nubia. Um, but in general, this area was considered to be um, ancient Egypt, the sort of the boundaries of ancient Egypt. Now, there's no, actually there is a little north, north here. So north is in this direction. And it's a little confusing the way that um, the, the geographical areas are described. Um, what you have is the southern part of Egypt called Upper Egypt. Um, and then the sort of middle area is called Middle Egypt. And then you've got the northern part of Egypt called Lower Egypt. And that is primarily because of the flow of the Nile. So the Nile, as, you, um, as you, I'm sure you already know, is really the lifeblood of ancient Egypt and it flows from the southern part and goes north. So Upper Egypt is closer to where the Nile originates, and then Lower Egypt is where it dumps out into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and this area here is called the Delta, where the Nile sort of breaks up into different tributaries, different rivers, and then flows out into the Mediterranean Sea. Now on this map off to the side here, it's just sort of a blow up of this. So you see Lower Egypt here, uh, Middle, Upper Egypt, and then Nubia down in the south. Um, and again, the, the Delta region up at the top. The Fayum is a little lake, lake area. We might get into that later. Um, I do want to mention that there are six, something called cataracts, which are shallow areas in the river where boats tend not to be able to get over. Um, and so there are six of these that just remember them to be shallow water. And what, what happens, tend, uh, what the Egyptians ended up doing is when they were building boats, they would have to drag the boats up on land and go around the cataracts and then put the boats back in the Nile. Um, another really important uh, thing to remember about ancient Egypt is, of course, I just mentioned the Nile and how important it was. Um, the sort of agricultural calendar is built around the flow of the Nile. So in about July, you get something called the inundation. And what that means is a much larger flow of water um, going northwards into um, Northern Egypt. And 
what's happening here, and I'll show you a map in just a second, is that you've got monsoon rains happening in central south, uh, uh, central eastern and southern eastern part of Africa, and all that rain collects into the, the, the Nile River and then flows northward. And so that's called the inundation. And really what's happening is that the Nile banks are flooding. Um, and what's happening during this time is that all the silt and minerals and things are coming from the south and they're flowing into the, the river, flowing along the river. And when they flood the banks, it leaves very rich soil. And so when farming started to happen in the Neolithic, people realized that they could keep track of when all this was happening. So July is about the inundation. Um, by October, the waters have gone back into their normal channel. And then that leaves all that soil, uh, damp soil, that you can start planting. And it's called the emergence because that's when the seeds start to uh, germinate. Um, then you've got harvest in late spring. And then you have something called the dry time between harvest, late spring, and July, um, the river is usually at its lowest level. So there's no farming during, during that time. And so that's the agricultural cycle. And that's really the, the, the calendar for these people. Um, it's not so much today because they built dams and um, the Nile doesn't quite flow like it does or like it did in the ancient world. But that's, that's the agricultural calendar. Um, and then I, I just mentioned that the reason you have the flow of the Nile is because of monsoon rains happening in uh, southern part of Africa. And this is Lake Vic Victoria where the Nile uh, starts. So it's, it flows north again. Um, you also have sort of two branches. One is the, the White Nile, which is the main one. And then you've got the Blue Nile. Um, and then you have other smaller, like a small lake called Lake, uh, lake Tana. But this is what it looks like from an overview um, higher up. And then this is, I thought I'd pop this picture. This isn't from the ancient world. This is um, the modern world where you clearly see the Nile and you can see all the agriculture that's being done along the edge of the Nile. And it's, it's a good comparison to what ancient Egyptians ended up doing. And then you can see the desert is right here. So in most of this time, you didn't have re really a lot of rain falling in Egypt. So they were totally dependent on the Nile. And the ancient Egyptians, as we'll talk about, started digging canals and moving water inland so that you could get larger agricultural output. This time. And then here's an even further out uh, looking out. So here's the Nile Delta here. And you can see later, especially in the New Kingdom, but it happens really early, uh, really even in the um, uh, early, early dynastic period, you have Egyptians going up and meeting other people. So like you've got the Phoenicians here, uh, the Mitanni here, um, and so on. And the Egyptian, and the, of course the Hittites. The, um, the Egyptians will have interactions with all of these people as they start moving out of Egypt. Okay, getting back to our object, which of course is the hand axe. And as I mentioned, they're really important because they can tell us a lot about the time. Um, we can help break down the time in ancient Egypt. And of course, it also tells us other things about uh, possibly society or groups of people getting together and interacting with each other. So Africa, um, we've got early forms of people coming out of Africa. Um, and Egypt was one of those areas where people could actually walk out of Africa. Um, we know these days that some people actually did get on boats and sail into uh, say where Italy, Turkey is, um, but we know that people also walked through. And of course, those people walking ended up maybe stopping in Egypt and staying there. So in a lower Paleolithic, you've got early hominids moving through Africa. Now, here's a couple of shots. Here's a couple of images of these hand axes. And what we have are stone axes. So I don't want you to think, though, that all they had was stone because it could have been other material. So bone, wood, stone. Now the, the problem, of course, if you think about the, the time scale we're talking about, if you're making a hand axe out of bone, 
How long do you think bone would last? Do you think it would last 700,000 years, enough for us to find it today? Possibly. Um, it just depends. And of course, wood, uh, same issue. Maybe even uh, wood would outlast a less amount of time than bone, especially if it fell into the Nile um, and decayed pretty quickly. So right now, we mostly have these stone hand axes. Um, from the way that these, these stone axes have been found, along with other uh, very tiny objects, or very small amount of objects, I should say, um, it's possible that people were living in temporary camps. We don't find any pottery during this time. And this is pretty pretty common thing to happen with early people where they're not organized enough right now or they don't have the technology to build something like pottery. So certainly they're hunting and gathering. They're using these hand axes right, maybe to kill animals or certainly to skin them and cut through the bone. Um, and we find that there are historians and archaeologists name um, these different types of hand axes based on styles. So Aculean, um, this is a, a type of hand axe, and these are found throughout like part of the Mediterranean and pushing into the Middle East, and it also dips down, this area dips down into Egypt. So that's why I put here, they're, they're found in other parts of the world as well. Now what you're looking at is these hand axes tend to be about six inches long, and something called bifacial flaking. So what that means is you have a piece of stone and they've chipped one edge, flipped the stone around and then flipped the other. That's the bi meaning two. So bifacial flaking. Um, and then, you know, we're not gonna spend a lot of time looking at all of these, but we've got the middle paleolithic going down to about uh, 50,000 BC. We still have hand axes but they, they start to disappear from the um, historical record and they also become smaller. So I mentioned just a few slides ago that the trend for these hand axes is to start off very early and large. And that as we get down closer to the Neolithic, they get smaller. Um, and we know that there's some type of industry built around making these hand axes. So people have to, and we'll talk about this in just a second, people have to go out and find the right type of stone, and then you have to know how to chip, chip them to get a sharp edge. Um, Mousterian is just like the, the last word I was just telling you about. This is named after sort of a, a grouping of um, the types of hand axes. So again, these are found throughout the Mediterranean and into Egypt and in, into uh, the Middle East. We find this type, like this, slightly smaller type found in Egypt and Nubia, which is in the southern uh, southern part uh, just below uh, Egypt. Um, and then this, there is something, I don't know if this slide's going to work, it's called the Le, uh, Levois method. I hope that that actually works. You can see how they're chipping the stone and then the slide should start again. So they chip around it and then take it out and then re, uh, resharpen everything. So this takes some skill to do. So I don't want you to think of these early Egyptians as being sort of cavemen, just running around grunting at each other, not doing anything. They're actually building things. And it's possible they built a lot more than this. We just don't have um, a lot of archeology span to, to, to tell us for certain what they were doing. Um, a couple of things. We know during the Middle Paleolithic, it was wetter. So you've got el more elephants, buffalo, and other large animals. Shaw is a textbook on uh, ancient Egypt. If you want to look at this, um, I can give you the citation. It's on page 19. Uh, we also have evidence for other animals at the, the Sidevine Cave, uh, which is down here. So there's pretty interesting things going on. Um, we also find the oldest known skeleton in Egypt, and it, you know, and it, these things change almost on a day day to day basis. But right now, um, it's around 5700 to 4500 BC. And then you do get the, the Levois method changing, meaning they're starting to chip their hand axes in a, a different way. And then you've got the Upper Paleolithic, which is the last stage of the Paleolithic. And, you know, I was showing you the long sort of, or the, the big hand axes. Now they're getting long and thin. So again, they're getting smaller. And this is when we first start to see mining activity, meaning we're finding a place where the Egyptians are going, they're digging into the ground, 
they're grabbing um, different types of stone that they know will chip very easily, and then they bring it back and chip, chip it into these hand axes. So the, the later part of the Neolithic goes to about 1200,000, uh, yeah, sorry, 12,000 BC. Um, and then you start, you know, we're still looking for where people are living. We're not seeing any sites where people are living in Lower Egypt, which of course is in the northern part. Now you're getting very small blades, which could possibly be arrowheads. Uh, we're not quite sure. In the southern part of Egypt, in Upper Egypt, we're starting to see places where people are living. So this is happening in the late Paleolithic. Um, I've put here, we've got evidence that they are hunting and gathering. And this is mostly done through bone re remains. So you find remains of cattle and gazelle and so on. They're also harvesting wild plants. So tubers, tubers are the roots that are probably grow growing of plants growing along the Nile. What's also interesting too, and I'll have you read, I think I have you read an article on uh, this very early cemetery, one of the earliest that we know of. It's in Upper Nubia. And it's really interesting, there's three of them, but what's, what's more interesting is that many of the people buried in this um, cemetery were died violently. So there are marks on the bones where it's clear that they, they've been hit. Um, there are still uh, arrowheads within their bones. And so, you know, this can tell us quite a bit about what's going on in terms of uh, groups of people. So clearly people are fighting during this period over what we don't know. It's all sort of guesswork. But it's an inter interesting thing to look at in terms of the way people are interacting with each other very early on. Now we move down to the Neolithic, and I just want to give you a quick introduction to what's happening in the Neolithic. So this is probably one, to me one of the most important time periods in human history, where um, people start to farm. Now, even though it's not called farming, you do sort of get early on domestication of cattle. Now what domestication means is they capture wild cattle, they bring them in, they probably build fences, they learn the mating habits so that you can produce more, more cattle. Uh, they're certainly digging wells for water, especially areas that are a little further out uh, from the Nile. We know from bone remains, they're still hunting wild animals. Um, we also know they're starting to treat food a little bit differently. So they're grinding up wild seeds, which makes it easier to eat, especially in terms of cooking. Um, they're starting to build enclosures, like stone huts and places where people are living. And you finally see the first bit of pottery. Now think about pottery in terms of technology. So it takes a bit of technology to realize that there's mud which is what they're grabbing from the, the, some parts of the Nile. And then they're firing it, meaning they're building a fire, they're heating it up, and they've realized that it could become almost permanent for them. Um, in the middle and late Neolithic, you find more pottery. And there, there's different styles. Remember I talked about seriation. So you've got something called black top pottery, which is just you've got a rim of black along the top. And then later you find different animals that are that are being uh, killed. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in a, a later um, lecture about the Neolithic, but we do find them building things as well. And there's a uh, something called the uh, Nabta Playa. And what it is, as you can see in this, what they've done is they set up these large stones um, in specific alignments. Um, and these are two to three feet tall. We don't know exactly what it is. It could be something religious. Um, there was a burial of a bull, which is interesting because later in Egyptian history, the, the bull becomes extremely important. Um, and when you're reading the different sources, you will see um, a word like tumulus, which just means mound. I'm not, I'm not gonna say that this is actually a, a tumulus, but if you look in this picture, you can see a mound in the background. And sometimes those mounds are built up of like human debris where they, they've been living in a certain place and the, the buildings fall down and they build higher and higher. Or it was built on purpose. It could be either, either one. Okay, this is the last slide coming back to the hand axe. So why did we look at this? Well, I hope that it's pretty clear that the hand axe can tell us quite a bit 
about what was going on in ancient Egypt. And of course, it also helps us to date because these early hand axes were much larger. And as you go, go down in time, they're getting closer to the present, these hand axes get smaller, narrower, and then they come down to um, arrowheads. And of course, they're used to kill animals. And as we've seen, uh, I talked a little bit about that cemetery, they're definitely being used to kill people as well. And so you sort of have to guess what's going on in terms of society this early. Uh, but that's why we started off looking at the hand axe.